I asked you guys to go camping. You're like, no. I asked you guys to go camping. You're like, no. Did it? Yes. What do you think of this picture? This Miami Vice. It's cute. What do you want? Same? This one or this one? Four or five. Five or six. And this is what everyone was worried about. They were. I was like, I think she's going to go. Why did you pick your eyes? I was working on. I want to see. Yeah, just told me he signed up for the live There's like five people that are on trial team that are going to be on trial team. How are you? It, you'll be fine. They're going to be professionals. So I'm going to be like, it's you know, what's a culture change? Okay, I'm going to have to plug both of these things in. There's a plug in. What was that joke? Do you remember growing up? Yeah. Plug it in, plug it in. And then we'll take a look. Do you ever make that joke? <laughs> <laughs> now, do I sit on these? Oh, good. Just put them on your hands. That's why I sit on them. Yeah. Actually, I don't know why I did that. Give me all of that. I can put it right here. Yes, yeah, you're not. Oh, you're facing the front. Where are you putting it? Yes, I've learned to censor myself because I've said some things before. <laughs> I'm back in the game. He's, um, he's 55. <laughs> well, I, I have his address. You're going to help me? Because, yeah, okay. Be careful what you say. Everyone's going to hear you. This is all. <gasps> oh! <laughs> oh! Good. Oh, wait, I want to know. Oh, whisper. Okay. I don't know. No, but she said it when no, she. Oh, Jesus. Okay, his first name is John. Jacob. He's from, he lived in Steamboat. Is his wife's name Kelly? Oh, yeah, it's already too late. Don't say what. Um. K is for Kelly, and she likes the kangaroos. No, it's like an alphabet game. I can say anything. Okay, I'll stop. I'll stop. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, I'll be the only person that watches it. She makes eggs. What happens? She <laughs> Before the accident. <laughs> Before. I'm told there's a good size delaying style wreck out there on Highway 50 on Columbia Drive. So forgive me if I'm dragging my feet slowly starting, but I'm trying to give people time to get through traffic and get here. Or we could do the opposite. How about like I wait till someone's open the door and I say, and that's it for our class tonight. Thank you. Yes. Pretend to leave. That's do it. Yes. That'd be a good joke to play mm -hmm. on whoever walks in the door. 
<laughs> we, can, we, can just leave. we can actually just leave. That's not a bad idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah. And I, I guess in a way, I guess in a way I've kind of done that. Yeah, let me uh let me mess with the big board here. Uh, I got the website. Oh, it's my mission. Yeah. The website. Is that the website. Website. No, it's it's time for you to I don't know what I'm supposed to say. Be honest. Be honest? No. I will never. If I'm being honest, something bad has happened. Can you believe we don't have any more I got all the links updated. So you can click here. For many of them, there's a partial or a full video recording. For one, there's an audio recording. Thanks to one of you who gave it to me. Thank you. So, and at least one or two classes don't have a recording. But if you weren't here, you could pretend you were. So, sort of like I'm not a professor, but I pretend to be. Go. All right. Well, despite the traffic delays, we've got a good turnout. Maybe we could start now. Someone took my clock away from the back of the wall. <laughs> yeah, let's go to the party upstairs. Oh, yeah. Let's all just leave and go to the party. I'm down for that. Yeah. Oh, the Christmas. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being here. If you braved some traffic to get here, I appreciate it. Last class is always a little bittersweet for me. It's, just, it's a, I'd be disingenuous if I didn't say it, it's a bit of relief to get to the last class. Anybody else feel on that too? Yeah, it's nice to get the semester over with. But with that said, it's been a great semester and it's it's bittersweet. I would gladly do a couple more classes with y'all. Y'all have been great. So, so uh, one of the great things you've done for me is put up with my public prayers. So I'm going to take a shot and see if you'll put up with it one more time. As always, this prayer is for you and about you and goes out to you and particular i know there's a final exam in this class is this the only class you have a final exam in no no it seems unanimous that there's more than one final exam to be taken and everybody's all set right you, you no no additional no. studying need. no it's just more work to be done gotta start gotta start yeah yeah you could open the book right about now if you want it yeah so how many finals who's got the most final exams who, who has two raise your hand Raise your hand if you have two or more. Two or more. Okay, who's got three? Keep your hand up if you have three or more. Still plenty of hands. Who have four or more? Four or more. Keep your hands up. Wow, I thought we'd be down to one or two hands by now. Five or more final exams. One, two, three. Still three hands up. Wow, who's going to get the dubious honor of winning this one? Who's got six or more final exams? Put your hand up. What? Is your hand up inadvertently or do you truly have... What's wrong with you? Does anyone beat seven? Seven final exams. Wow. Wow. I, I'm talking about this semester, not over a lifetime. No, I, I know you're telling the truth. Huh? Wow. Seven and seven going once, seven going twice. We have a winner. If, if that's a win, you have seven final exams. All right. Well, you know, for everyone else, just remember this. As bad as it seems, at least you don't have seven final exams. That's that's all but you, sir. You say that. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry you won that contest. Yeah. yeah. But but best of luck to you. Best of luck to all of you. You're my prayers. And here it goes. Hopefully, since it's the last one, I'll, hopefully I'll make it a good one. All right. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to your protection, implored your help, or sought your intercession was left unaided. Inspired by that confidence, we fly unto you, O Virgin of Virgins, our Mother. To you do we come, before you do we stand, sinful and sorrowful. 
O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in your mercy hear and answer them. The Gospel according to St. Luke, the agony in the garden. Then going out, Jesus went as was his custom to the Mount of Olives and his disciples followed him. When they arrived at the place, he said to them, pray that you may not undergo the test, departing about a stone's throw away from them and kneeling, he prayed saying, Father, if you are willing, take this cup away from me. Still, not my will, but yours be done. And to strengthen him, an angel from heaven appeared to him. He was in such agony, and he prayed so fervently that his sweat became like drops of blood falling to the ground. Lord God, Heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, I include this scripture in our prayer today to remind us that even Jesus had to undergo the test. Jesus is truly God and Jesus is truly man. And mankind, humanity, it's part of our fate to have to undergo the test. Soon everyone, dear Lord, within the sound of my voice will undergo a final exam or two or three or seven. <laughs> After that, a bar exam or two. After that, so many tests. So many tests throughout our days. So many tests of our character. So many tests of our integrity. So many tests of whether our will or yours will be done. Lord God, Heavenly Father, none of us need go through any of these tests alone. My prayer to you, Heavenly Father, is to do for these adopted sons and daughters of yours what you did for your begotten son. Send them an angel. In that part of the gospel we just heard, dear Lord, I didn't hear Jesus ask for an angel. I just heard that you sent an angel. Please do for them what you did for him. If it is your will, Heavenly Father, pay no attention to who asks. Just send your angel. Pay no attention if it is your will, Heavenly Father, to who at any given moment has faith or lacks faith. Look not upon our faith, but on the faith of your church and grant us your salvation, Heavenly Father. And send that angel, one each, to be with them all the days of their life. And so we pray, angel of God, my guardian dear, to whom God's love commits me here, ever this day be at my side to light and guard and rule and guide. Amen. amen. Father, Son, Holy amen. Spirit, amen. You've put up with me for 24 hours, just two to go. You're almost there. <laughs> and I left you with this question. In light of the supremacy of the federal constitution, what rights do states hold to create and regulate local governments? And is it not a fair question? Remember back to chapter one, remember the lesson of federalism. What was the scoreboard? 13 and 0. When did the federal supremacy clause reign supreme? All right. But the federal says that the state has the ability to create municipal corporations, to create cities, towns, villages, Hamlets, the villages. Have you heard of this town? <laughs> it's right here in Florida, the villages. And that's 
Long standing. Here's the SCOTUS decision from 1907, Hunter versus City of Pittsburgh. Municipal corporations are political subdivisions of the state, given the power to acquire, hold, and manage personal and real property. The powers conferred upon these corporations rest in the absolute discretion of the state, says the Supreme Court of the United States. Neither their charters nor any law conferring governmental powers or vesting in them property to be used for governmental purpose or authorizing them to hold or manage such property or exempting them from taxation upon it is controlled by the federal constitution. None of it controlled by the federal constitution, says the Supreme Court of the United States in Hunter versus City of Pittsburgh. Therefore, SCOTUS says that a state at its pleasure may modify or withdraw all such powers. In all these respects, the state is supreme in its legislative body, conforming its action to the state constitution. So here's the federal Supreme Court of the United States saying that the state constitution prevails. The state constitution may do as, it's well, as it will, unrestrained by any provision of the Constitution of the United States. Where do we find a federal basis for the state constitution to reign supreme in this area? 1907 says, 1907 decision of Hunter versus City of Pittsburgh, which is still good law, has not been overruled. This clearly is within state powers to create municipal corporations. So we're going to look at four different things. We're going to look at charter counties versus non-charter counties. We're going to look at other types of municipal corporations. But to begin, we're going to look at things called ordinances and resolutions. Now, when our state legislature meets, our state senate and our state house of representatives, and they pass a law, generally speaking, we refer to that as a statute. But under our Constitution, such laws need not arise from only the state legislature. Municipal corporations, such as counties, cities, towns, hamlets, villages, the villages, have the power to enact laws. Those laws are territorial in nature, so Orange County's laws aren't binding on Dade County. Just as Duval's county's laws are not binding on Sumter County. But nevertheless, if you happen to be physically in that county, you'd better obey those laws because lawmaking power extends to municipal corporations. We don't refer to those laws generally as statutes. Instead, we use this vocabulary, ordinance, or resolution. The primary difference is that a resolution is either of a temporary nature or a point of administrative guidance. Be it resolved that today is law student day. Now there won't be any one put in jail or suffering any financial fines for violating law student debt. Because that was a resolution. On the other hand, an ordinance is of permanent nature and can subject you to financial fines or a loss of your freedom or any combination of both. If it is of a permanent nature, then it must be passed as an ordinance. It can't begin with the phrase, be it resolved. If it begins with the phrase, be it resolved, it's not enforceable as an ordinance. It is unconstitutional to pass it in the form of a resolution. An ordinance is a regulation of a general and permanent nature and enforceable as a local law. A resolution is an expression concerning a matter of administration of a temporary character or disposition of administrative business. 
be it resolved that we shall begin the search for a new city manager. That's fine. Be it resolved that the city manager shall have a term of four years, a salary of $100,000 apiece, be regulated according to the following rules. Not fine. That would need to be passed as an ordinance because it's a regulation of a general permanent nature and it's enforceable as a local law. So this is the lawmaking power and it's also the lawmaking limits of local laws. The ordinance is general and permanent. The resolution is a matter of administration, temporary administrative business. Let's look at charter counties and non-charter counties. What makes a charter county a charter county? What makes a non-charter county a non-charter county? Get ready for this. Get your pens and papers ready. Got your laptop, have your hands on the keyboards. If you pass a charter, you're a charter county. If you haven't passed a charter, you're not a charter county. I know I better repeat that so we all get it, right? <laughs> I saved the most complex stuff for last, didn't I? I tell you, the class has been so easy for now. Now I'm throwing these hard balls at you right before the final exam. A charter is not a constitution. With that said, by analogy, it's an almost fair analogy because it's a source of organic law and it spells out the charter government and it spells out issues of administration and powers of lawmaking bodies and, and things you might find in a constitution. But counties don't have constitutions, but counties can have charters. How do you get a charter? You got to draft one. You're still writing all this down, right? Got to draft one, get, right? Then you got to vote, right? Tallahassee's got to prove it. Local, local voters must also vote on it and approve it. It's heavy, heavy stuff. You getting all this? Should I slow down? But obviously then there would be a difference between a charter and a non-charter county, right? Here's Article 8, Section G. Florida's Constitution, charter government, counties operating under county charters shall have all powers of local self-government not inconsistent with the applicable law. Okay? Compare that to non-charter government. This is Article 8, Section F of Florida's Constitution. Counties not operating under county charters shall have such powers of self-government as is provided by the applicable law. We're splitting hairs here now, people. <laughs> so if you've got a charter, you could do whatever you want as long as it's not illegal. If you ain't got a charter, you can't do it unless it's legal. Anybody still awake? There is a difference. There is a difference. So if it's not inconsistent with the law and you're a charter county, then you can do it. But you can't do anything as a non-charter county unless the law says you can. What we're referring to here is a concept that the scholars call home rule. Home rule refers to the theory, in some places, the reality of an inherent power of a local government. Which of these two would be closest to a constitutional home rule, in your opinion? Yes. The charter government. Yeah, the charter government. I agree. Why? Because uh, it's not constrained uh, by uh, laws that are in place. As long as it's not prescribed, prescribed by law, then uh, the government that's well put. Everyone follow that? So assuming there is such a thing as home rule, 
the opposite of Dylan's rule, if you're really into this, then I guess this would be a constitutional home rule. Does that mean in Florida that a non-charter county lacks home rule? Well, it would if we hadn't at the Florida legislature passed the Municipal Home Rule Powers Act, which extends home rule to non-charter governments. So there's a constitutional home rule. There it is in subsection G. And there's a statutory home rule, which extends arguably the powers of constitutional home rule to those non-charter governments, which under the constitution didn't have it. Wow. So first we were splitting hairs about the difference and now we're passing statutes to minimize what difference there was. <laughs> Florida truly is not Dylan's rule. Florida's home rule. Question, let's apply what we've learned. Can a non-charter county enact a law saying something is a crime? Answer, yes, if a law permits this. Can a charter county enact a law making something a crime? Yes, unless a law forbids this. Get it? All right. Wow. Like you, I'm pretending to be interested. <laughs> okay. Let's talk about sovereign immunity. What's that? Anybody encountered it before? Who can tell me what sovereign immunity is? I really did put all of you asleep. Yes? Uh, in certain circumstances, someone operating under government capacity is not individually liable, but they are, they, are they, they, they have sovereign immunity. They can't be held individually accountable. Nailed it. Love well, it. It's the concept that you can't sue the sovereign. Sovereign's immune, that the government is not subject to suit. Indeed, if we look at the language of Florida's constitution, do we see the establishment of sovereign immunity? Or do we see the waiver of an immunity that already existed? Let's take a look at the language, shall we? This is Article 10, Section 13, suits against the state. And that's what we're talking about with sovereign immunity. We're talking about, can I sue the government? Can I sue the state of Florida? Can I sue the county of Orange? Can I sue the city of Winter Park? Can I sue the South Florida Water Management District? Can I sue the agency, Florida Agency for Healthcare Administration? Suits against the state. The language reads, Provision may be made by general law for bringing suit against the state as to all liabilities now existing or hereinafter originate. I would suggest that the author of our Constitution is presuming that sovereign immunity already exists and is providing the constitutional right for lawmaking bodies to waive that pre existing immunity. So if I was looking for an example of where the state constitution is not a grant of power, but is a restriction upon power. Maybe, maybe I could point to this because this language is not attempting to grant sovereign immunity, but instead grant the power to waive sovereign immunity. Sovereign immunity is, the theory goes, an inherent power in the state of Florida. That inherently we can't sue the sovereign. Now why in this day and age, would laws making government above the law continue to exist? Anybody ever see a news story nowadays alleging some sort of government act or individual allegedly is acting above the law? Has that ever happened? Is that ever in the news? Sometimes. That allegation? Yeah. So why in this day and age would we have sovereign immunity? Why would we put the government beyond liability. Why not make the government liable? What if the government violates your client's constitutional rights? What if you're a really good lawyer? 
what if you not only win that case, but you inflame that jury? That jury awards buckets and buckets of money. You know, I love to turn the hyperbole to make my point. The jury comes back and fills out the jury form with so many zeros, they've got to flip the page over to the next side. A hundred trillion dollars <laughs> payable by the state of Florida to your client for the state of Florida's outrageous behavior in violating your client's Florida constitutional rights. Well, of course, the first question is, what's 40% of a hundred trillion dollars? <laughs> The second question is, where's that money coming from? And the answer to that question, fellow Floridians, is to look in the mirror. Where's that money coming from? You're driving here on Highway 50 where there's a wreck. Who came to the rescue of those in the wreck? Who paved State Road Highway 50 to begin with? Who put up the traffic signal that somebody ran and caused it? Who established the ambulance that's sent there? What if we satisfy the $100 trillion judgment, okay? And we just stop making roads. We stop fixing traffic lights. We stop paving the streets. We stop paying the police officers. We stop having ambulances and fire trucks. From that perspective, is that good or bad? Sovereign immunity persists for very practical purposes. We, the taxpayers, satisfy these judgments. And in the extreme, whether it's a single hyperbole of a $100 trillion judgment or a hundred judgments for a trillion or a trillion judgments for a hundred, without sovereign immunity, all there's left for you and I your children and your children's children is to satisfy these judgments. But government has other duties, does it not? So as outrageous as sovereign immunity in theory seems, for a very practical reason, it persists. Right? But you're the lawyers, you're the future plaintiff's attorneys, perhaps, defense attorneys, perhaps, your question is, how do I get around the sovereign immunity, get my money? I will not let you down. I'll talk about that too. Common law immunity of the state of Florida and its municipal corporations, God bless you, and its agencies. This summarizes common law immunity with regard to a state law claim. What do I mean by state law claim? Violation of a Florida statute, violation of Florida common law. What would that involve? How about a tort? How about negligence? How about an automobile wreck? How about medical malpractice? All those things fall under our tort system, our tort statutes and common law. What about a breach of contract? Again, state law. So who's immune from what? Here's Common law immunity. State of Florida and its immunity is total, but lesser sovereigns are not. The state of Florida is immune. The counties exercising the arm of the state are immune. But municipalities are not immune from tort liability when performing the municipality's proprietary functions. McGinley, break it down. Okay. I'll break it down. <laughs> Talking first about the state. So we're talking about not the county or the city, but the state. To the extent that the agency is not a county agency or a city agency, to the extent that the agency is a state agency, we're talking about them too. And under the common law, and I got a statute that messes all this up in just a minute. But first I'll teach you the common law, then I'll throw in the statute that messes it all up. Under the common law, state of Florida, Total immunity. Sometimes state of Florida will delegate not to a statewide agency like Division of Motor Vehicles, but instead de delegate to counties, 
to do the work. To the extent there's been such a delegation, we call that the county being the arm of the state. How do we know when it's the arm of the state? If ultimately it was the state's responsibility to do it, and the state delegated that responsibility. With that delegation comes that total immunity. But of course, counties do many things other than what is delegated to them by the state government. And they don't get that total immunity without that delegation. Instead, we're going to find that they're not immune from tort liability when they're performing proprietary functions. Literally, the function of a proprietor. Literally, liability that arises from owning stuff. Anybody own a motor vehicle? If you run someone over or crash your motor vehicle into someone's property, do you expect to be liable? Sure. Why? Because you own a motor vehicle. Same thing with the county. And it's proprietary functions. Owning a motor vehicle can be held liable in tort for negligently operating. What if their land is leaking toxic waste? Again, proprietary function of being the landowner. So those are a non-exclusive list of a few examples. This is common law immunity. But common law immunity can be affected by statute. You remember when we looked at the language of the Constitution, it empowered the legislature to alter sovereign immunity. And it did in many, many Florida statutes here in the last few minutes of the long semester, I'm not going to hold you responsible for any and all Florida statutes. I'll stick you with this one, but it's a doozy. 768.28. This is within our tort system. Chapter 768 our tort, involves our tort laws. The state and its agencies and subdivisions shall be liable for tort claims, but liability shall not include punitive damages or prejudgment interest. Neither the state nor its agencies or subdivisions shall be liable to pay a claim or a judgment by any one person which exceeds the sum of $200,000 or when totaled with all other claims or judgments in that suit exceeds the sum of $300,000. That portion of the judgment that exceeds these amounts may be paid in part or in whole only by further act of the legislature. But can we break it down? Yes, yes, I will. You're the plaintiff's attorney. Had a great day in court. Long, exhausting day. Jury finally came back out of nine o'clock at night. Is that late for you guys? Okay. For anyone who's not late, 2 a.m., okay? Finally, the jury comes back. You've won. You've prevailed against the state for a million dollars. Sounds good, right? But that's not all. Another million dollars in punitive damages. Wow, that's two million. <laughs> you go and celebrate with your loved ones, you fall asleep and you dream about what? 40% of $2 million, that's what you dream about. And you can't wait to do what the judge said after dismissing the jury. That is to come back first thing in the morning with verdict in hand so she, the judge, can sign the judgment. That's at 8.30 a.m. here, and you've been there since 7 a.m. You got that judgment at hand. Two million. You hand it to the judge. She grabs her pen. She's about to sign. Oh, one typo, she says. <laughs> you look at the page. It's a judgment. It's signed. But that second million for punitive damages is completely crossed out. And the first million has been changed to 200000 You're polite. Your Honor, it's a long night last night. I understand. 
but here's the judgment. We polled the jury. So say we all. A million plus a million. That's right, says the judge. But don't forget Florida Statute 768.2A. What does that statute do? Break it down. You got a million on top of your million for punitive damages. How much does the state liable for? On that second million, they're liable for zero. On the first million, that wasn't punitive damages. That was economic damages. That was also a billion. But they're liable for what? 200,000. All right. Where do I get the other 1.8 million? Over here. That portion of the judgment that sees these amounts may be paid in whole and part by further act of the legislature. Legislature. You can beg that judge all you want. She's not going to sign it. And you can file a notice of appeal and you're not going to win. Then you're going to try to get jurisdiction of the Florida Supreme Court. But, of course, that's not even on the list. Maybe even head over to the federal system and try to, I don't know, rid of whatever. But none of the courts will help you. You got to get a law passed. That's right. The House and the Senate have to pass a law giving you and your client $1.8 million. Does it happen? Well, it could. But it's not because of any good lawyering. It's because of good lobbying, right? Got to lobby for the rest. So that's how sovereign immunity works. Who has a question about sovereign immunity? I liked Justice Cantero's dissent in American Home versus National Railroad, how it ties together common law immunity with statutory immunity. Sovereign immunity of municipalities must be construed strictly, whereas the immunity of the state must be construed more broadly. Under the common law, the state's immunity was total, but municipalities never enjoyed total immunity. Before 768.28, in proprietary functions, a municipality has the same tort liability as a private corporation. So for one, the state of Florida, before the passage of 768.28, it owed nothing. This statute increased its liability because it owed something. But for those entities that lacked common law stat, sovereign immunity, I knew it began with an S. For those entities that lacked common law sovereign immunity, this gave them. So much like the charter and non-charter counties, we started by splitting hairs, but in the end, we kind of leveled the playing field, didn't we? Yeah. Save the most complex stuff here for last, didn't we? Essentially, the state and its agencies on the one hand and municipalities on the other arrived at 768.28 from opposite directions. The state from a status of near total immunity and municipalities from a status of near non-existent immunity. <coughs> Just as Cantero's dissent says it better than I can. <coughs> but whether you understand it the way he said it or you understand it the way I said it, the point is to understand it. And what is it that we're understanding? that you need permission from the state of Florida to sue the state of Florida. Strange, but true. Where do you find that permission? Either in the common law, where you had no permission against the state, in all permissions in the world against the municipalities, but you can't stop there. You have to exhaust the Florida statutes and meet their requirements regarding immunity. Sovereign immunity statutes sometimes create pre-suit requirements and permit the dismissal of lawsuits for failure to exhaust those pre-suit requirements. As you review the semester and you study past things, where before did we see a pre-suit requirement and the potential for getting a suit 
dismissed for failure to exhaust the pre-suit requirement. You remember? Yes, uh, agency suits. Yes, where else? Your client's been wronged. Yes. EEOC. Yes, EEOC, FCHR, the Florida Civil Rights Act. Yeah. Remember, despite the egregious nature of the claim that your client's civil rights have been violated, either in his employment or some other instances, you couldn't march right off to court. You had to exhaust your administrative emergencies. You had to file with either the Florida Commission on Human Relations or the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission or dual filed. Or another option might be if your particular county municipality has its own EEOC style Commission on Human Relations, you might have to file there. But in any, any event, you had to exhaust your pre-suit requirements. And again, sovereign immunity statutes often read the same way. And they can because the state has to give permission to sue the state. This case will either thrill you or disgust you. It's the end of the semester. I won't put you on the spot. I'll brief it for you. And in my usual style, I'll add some poetic license. Pan Am had a contract with the Department of Corrections. Lawyers got involved. Contract was beautifully written. All the right people signed it. Perfectly enforceable. Looks great. Only problem was the Department of Corrections didn't pay. So Pan Am went to court. And in my poetic license, the attorneys from Department of Corrections said, yes, Your Honor, we're here. We didn't pay. Now go ahead and dismiss this suit, Your Honor. What, 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 what was the argument that came from plaintiffs to counsel, Pan Am? To which the judge responded, what, 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 what? <laughs> yeah, that's right, said the defense attorney for the state. We're the state of Florida. <laughs> we breached the contract, sure. But we're not paying. Sovereign immunity. Yeah, said the judge. Nothing for you, Pan Am. Pan Am appeals. That's tough, says the DCA. Nothing for you, Pan Am. Somehow, they get jurisdiction up here at the Supreme Court of Florida. Don't get me started. Supreme Court of Florida says this. That's not fair. We hereby hold that when the government knowingly enters into a contract, that means they waive their sovereign immunity because they entered into the contract. Here's your money, Penny. Bless you. Two ways to look at that. One way is judicial activism. Where's that? It's in there, says the Supreme Court of Florida. In the text of our Constitution, we're not citing to anything else. It's in there. And please, poetic license. Please, no one bother us for an exact page or line. It's, it's in there. <laughs> Can we appeal such a decision to the Supreme Court of the United States? No. Why? It has an adequate and independent, you're about to say that, right? You remember Michigan versus Long? Yeah, even though it happened in the first class, you still remember it. Even if it were to hypothetically show up on the final exam, Hey, right, you wrote a paper on it. Anyone else write a paper on it? Yeah, yeah. What if, or let me phrase it this way. What do you call a misinterpretation of the state constitution made by the state's highest court with reference to nothing but the plain text of the state constitution and reliance upon nothing else? Yes. Did everyone hear that? You call it the new correct interpretation of the state constitution. Because what else are you going to call it? They've become infallible because they're final. There's nowhere to appeal because of Michigan versus Long. Sounds like judicial activism to me, which I don't like. Judges should call balls and strikes. Judges shouldn't decide public policy. 
I elected my elected officials to decide public policy. But that's just my opinion. You know, maybe you prefer a world where, you know, you just admit that other people should make all your decisions for you and you shouldn't have a say in, in things like government or rights or freedom. For me, that sounds like a disgusting totalitarianism that I would die to prevent. But for you, maybe it's the right thing. We all get to decide. Every generation gets to decide. Many an American died making that decision. God bless him for it. But you also have Pan Everest Department of Corrections. So, quote, where the state has entered into a contract fairly authorized by the powers granted by general law, the defense of sovereign immunity will not protect the state from actions arising from the state's breach of contract. Where's that in our state constitution? Where's that in the Florida statutes? It's here. It's in Pan Am versus Department of Corrections. So that's where that is. Okay. Let's talk about sunshine laws. Spent the semester talking about how each state can be a laboratory democracy. And while never denying any citizen the full panoply of federal rights can experiment with granting greater, perhaps even new rights. Perhaps Florida's sunshine laws are an example of Floridians having greater rights to government transparency, government accountability, and open government versus Americans as a whole. Many a commentator has said that Florida's sunshine laws, Florida's open government laws, Florida's government accountability laws, Florida's transparent government laws are among the broadest and the most granting of human rights and civil rights in the nation. Are they right? Are they not right? I haven't done a state-by-state -state survey myself, but there's plenty of quotes for that. They're certainly broader than what we would have under federal law. And I can show you why. First, Article 1, Section 24 of Florida's Constitution was amended in 1992. God bless you. And it requires access to public records and meetings. Every person has the right to inspect or copy any public record made or received. Made or received. This section specifically includes the legislative, executive, and judicial branches of government. Which branch of government did they leave out? None. But just in case you thought they did, it also includes counties, municipalities, and any other entity of government. Yeah. Any thing made or received. Here's one for you. You're a cub reporter, but you want the big break. So you're waiting with your cameraman outside state representative so 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 and so's office. Okay. And you're demanding to see the emails and promising your viewers outrageous things. So right before you go on air, you email representative so-and-so with an attachment of an outrageous thing. Ah, you're a good cub reporter, right? Camera's rolling. Can representative so-and-so say, no, I, I'm not going to share that email for, for you. It wasn't anything I created in my government capacity. It wasn't anything I solicited. It's not part of my duties. I didn't even ask for this email. You can't have it. Are those defenses? No. Anything made or received. Representative so-so didn't ask for it. Doesn't matter. If the government has it, state of Florida has it, they've got to share it under the sunshine law. Pretty powerful stuff, right? What if they don't? You can sue, and you not only get the thing, but the government has to pay your attorney fees for prevailing, and sovereign immunity won't prevent it. But wait, there's more. There's three basic requirements of Florida Sunshine Law, because in addition to being in the Constitution, we also have statutes. 
First, meetings of public boards or commissions must be open to the public. Two, reasonable notice of such meetings must be given. And three, minutes of the meetings must be taken and properly recorded. Let's compare this state of Florida requirement to federal requirements. I don't want to pick on either political party. At one point in my life, I was one political party. At this point in my life, I'm another political party. Probably be the same for you. I'm not trying to make a political statement here. I'm trying to compare how the federal government operates when it comes to transparency and accountability to how the state government operates. So let's say there's the U.S. House of Representatives such and such caucus. We're going to create a group of like-minded politically representatives. They're going to meet and discuss how to vote on legislation. And indeed, there are such caucuses, are there not? both in the U.S. House and the U.S. Senate. Anything illegal or improper about that under federal law? Absolutely not. Do we have the right to march in with our cameras and have the cameras rolling and see what the House such and such caucus is talking about under federal law? No. What if one party, the Democrats, Republicans, whoever it is, wants to meet in the basement of the Capitol to discuss strategy and exclude the press? Can they? Yes. I was driving here earlier today, and I heard that that's what one party had done before their leader made today's <coughs> political announcement. Happens all the time, but not in the Florida legislature. That's a violation of a Floridian's constitutional rights. There is no right for any two or more elected officials to meet in private. None. The training that Florida elected officials undergo and their training manuals, some of which are quoted in the book here, seem outrageous at first blush. When you're having a meeting of the Board of County Commissioners and there's a bathroom break, you're advised to go one at a time into the bathroom because you don't want to have two or more elected officials alone in the bathroom. That could be a violation of the Sunshine Law, advises the man. You know, I love to turn to hyperbole, so I'll do that now. Tim and Tom have been lifelong friends. And on Taco Tuesdays, they love the Taco Bell. <laughs> but Tim and Tom both got elected to the county commission. Can Tim and Tom still enjoy Taco Tuesday at the Taco Bell? The answer is this. Yes, if... First, Tim and Tom give notice to the public of Taco Tuesday. They eat their tacos in the public part of the Taco Bell. And somebody takes some minutes and records them. Tim got his usual extra guacamole. Tom, as usual, won't pay extra for guacamole. File that away. Hyperbole, yes, but very wickedly close to true. <laughs> because our open government and transparency laws are that broad. Review them for yourself. They're in the text. Review the manual. The bathroom thing is not a joke that I talked about. That wasn't hyperbole. That's in there. Here's a tough one. County commission is getting sued. They want to hear from their lawyer. Are we winning or are we losing? And if we do lose, how much will we up? Can they meet with their lawyer in private? Until an amendment to the Sunshine Laws, the answer was no. They had to hold all this in public. And who showed up? Plaintiff's attorney, right? Oh, look at that. I am winning. <laughs> I'm going to win 500000 An exception exists, and here's how it goes. This is how extreme open government transparency is under Florida Sunshine Laws. At that meeting, we first hear publicly of the need for the private meeting where everyone else can hear it. We then confirm that we have a transcriptionist, a court reporter, who can take down everything verbatim. 
we then adjourn temporarily with only those individuals absolutely necessary to this meeting with the lawyer. The court reporter is there and transcribes anything and everything that anybody says at that meeting, including who attended, what time it began, what time it ended. That record is then sealed, but only temporarily. The meeting then returns to its public status and once it's been determined that the lawsuit is resolved, the transcript becomes public. Wow. Compare that to the federal government where one party can meet in the basement of the Capitol and plan out their strategy. Big difference, right? I'm not trying to make a political commentary by pointing that out. I'm trying to point out the transparency, the open government differences between what Americans as a whole have a right to when it comes to federal law, that floor, that bare minimum of federal constitutional rights, and the higher rights of a Floridian when it comes to transparency and open government from the state of Florida and state government. Do you see the differences there? Here's Article 3, Section 4, as amended in 1990, talking about the legislature. The rules of procedure of each house have to provide that all meetings of each house shall be open and noticed to the public, as well as all prearranged gatherings between more than two members. What if two or more state senators or two or more representatives are in the same political party? Can they create a caucus? They're like-minded. Can they get together and talk about legislation? No, it's got to be public. They can't have private meetings like that. As to the executive branch and local government, collegial bodies, what legally is meant by a collegial body? That's any group, any entity, any body that makes its decision by voting collegially. So a collegial body. As the executive branch and local government collegial bodies, any gathering of two or more members to discuss a matter that may foreseeably become before that body is considered a public meeting and must be noticed and open. Is it a defense to say, well, we met privately on Tuesday, but that issue doesn't come up for a vote for another six weeks? No, oh, not a defense. But how do you enforce this? What if there is a private meeting? Any law or action taken thereafter after a violation of the Sunshine Law, is null, void, and unenforceable. And any attorney action needed to prove that it's null, void, or unenforceable becomes an attorney fee liability of the government to be paid by the government. There even are instances where the individual lawmakers who violated the statute can be held personally. Tim and Tom enjoy Taco Tuesday in Atlanta. Is that a defense? Tim and Tom were my hypothetical elected officials, local elected officials. They are bound by these laws as Floridian elected officials, regardless of where in the world they might be. So their Taco Tuesday held in Atlanta can render null and void the action that happens later in Florida and may, under certain circumstances, lead to their own personal financial liability. This is far greater protection from a lack of government transparency than we have at the federal level, far greater. Can I pass a law that creates an exception to sunshine? The answer is yes, but look at the great restrictions that apply. First, the law on its face has to specify the public necessity for the exception. Then the exception may be no broader than necessary to accomplish that particular stated reason. And the single subject rule applies no other subject matter other than the exceptions in their enforcement may be addressed in this particular bill that becomes a law. Quite often, 
when something is alleged to be unconstitutional, good lawyering comes into play. You remember the standards. Sometimes it's a rational basis. Sometimes it's compelling state interest. The lawyer might get creative, come up with that rational basis, come up with that compelling state interest. Not here. The only relevant excuse, the only relevant basis for the exception to the Sunshine Law is the one that was stated in the law at the time the exception was passed. It's the only one the government can rely upon. We take away some of the creative lawyering and we give more power back to the people when it comes to the state of Florida and open government and government transparency. With that, I no longer burden you with any new material. Instead, I'm going to review the semester as a whole. Sound fair? Sound fun? I mentioned last class, and I'll repeat now. No offense, but I take no questions from the floor during the review of the entire semester. And no offense for that, but the reason I do it is I've only got so many minutes. I've got a lot to cover. The other reason I do it is the potential for hijacking. You know, somebody turns those few minutes into whatever they were focused on, and then I can't cover what I was focused on. Normally, I can fix that by covering it next class, but as you notice, there is no next class. So I don't take any questions from the floor, and I mean no disrespect in not doing that. I'm looking out for your best interest, at least in my opinion. I hope my opinion's right. The other thing is, uh, it's probably the most requested part of my lecture that people ask for permission to record over the years, because some people want to hear it more than once. On the flip side, it's also the most requested part of my lecture that people want to skip. So I'm going to start the attendance sheet now. Go ahead and sign in. And if you'd like to leave, I respect that because I'm not covering anything new. Let me start the attendance sheet now. Thank you. Back again to the flip side. I've seen people try to like take a verbatim transcript of my review. And I always thought it'd be nice if there was like an automated way to do that. And when I was updating the website the other day, I noticed my YouTube videos of these lectures, which if you've got insomnia, you'll want to play one of those, put you asleep real quick. But there's a button on the YouTube where you can download an automated transcript of everything I said. It's, of course, not 100% accurate because it's automated. Anytime I said anything embarrassing, that would be a computer mistake. That's not really what I said. <laughs> <laughs> but for that reason, and I think I may have even expressed it in the last class, I've always wished I had the time to record this summary. So this morning at the law office, I canceled and rescheduled some things, and I actually found the time to do that. So I'm going to be able to play a recording for you of this summary. So with that said, if you have better places to be, I respect that. You don't have to sit here and watch the recording. You can watch it anytime you like. In fact, I've got it right here on the website. What's about to happen? You may remember we've got a class website, flaconstitution.com, because FL Constitution and Florida Constitution.com were both taken. So I got flaconstitution.com. Yes. And over there, there's a click for downloads. And then over there are the slides. So you can see the slides there, pops them up. That's the review for the final exam, in case you want to copy and paste from them or look at them. And then likewise, right next to that is the video, which after our 10 minute break, I'll hit play. Sound good? Yeah. All right. If anybody's leaving instead of saying, staying, make sure you sign the attendance sheet. The only thing worse than having to sit through my lecture is not getting credit for it. <laughs> so make sure you get credit for it. So the review got Yeah, let's take a 10 minute break. And then, I don't know if anybody's got popcorn, go ahead and pop it. So then we'll watch the movie. The review is that we're going to be watching the video. Right, yeah. Okay. Yeah. You aren't saying anything. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> Let's all go. I wouldn't, wouldn't blame anybody. Wouldn't blame at all. <laughs>